While me and Jerry agree on most things concerning cars and driving, Volkswagen, Audi and the rest of the group is something that we occasionally disagree on. Especially VW. While Jerry sees a well-engineered people's car with good equipment and well-sorted out driving dynamics, I see a dull palais with different shades of grey wrapped up in over-servoed brakes and engine carbon build-up and engine carbon build-up problems. But when we had the chance to go and drive the Mark V R32 Golf, we both were equally excited. And at the first glance it might be a bit hard to see why. While this one looks good, in the stock form it doesn't look that exciting, barring the center-mounted double exhaust tips. And inside the Golf is much the same story. A few minor tweaks compared to your mom's 1.4, but nothing that will make you feel uncomfortable in your underwear. But open the hood and you'll find something that will. If you're the sort of person who subscribes to Engineering Explained on YouTube. Hello everyone! Well, I certainly do, so let me elaborate. You see, normally in a car, your cylinders would be lined up in line like this. Or in a V, like this. But when you put them in line, transversely, you can only fit so many. And putting them in a V is quite stupid this way, because it would take up a lot of space and the center part would be kind of unused. But Volkswagen wanted to cram more cylinders into their little engine, so they just thought they'd put them like this. See? Like this. The first appearance of this engine was the same year the Cold War ended and more importantly, I was born. 1991. I can feel an inaccurate history lesson coming. Fasten your seatbelts. It was the clever German way of getting more cylinders into the existing Passat platform without too many modifications to the rest of the car. But the car we car guys are more interested in in that particular era is the VR6 Corrado. The Corrado was very unlike VWs of that era, a sleek coupe-like design that looked like it could have been drawn by Pininfarina himself. And let's imagine it was, because let's be honest, it's a lot sexier to say Pininfarina than Schaffer. Anywho, despite the looks, the Corrado never quite had the umph, but with this compact six cylinder, it was finally cashing checks that it couldn't before. And it's much the same story with the Golf G. And it's much the same story with the Golf GDIs around that time. The once cheap and cheerful little hot hatch was slowly gaining weight and losing its sense of humor. But in 1992, they crammed this glorious engine into the Mark III Golf's engine bay as well. And the V-Motor und Reichenmotoren Kult was born. Kult. <laughs> and what you're looking at here is the last hurrah of the VR engine Golf. And joy of joys, it powers all four wheels. What is it, George? You have a question? Yes. Does a hot hatch need to be all-wheel drive? Well, the hot hatches nowadays have become more heavier and more powerful. So it makes a lot of sense that a new Focus RS has four-wheel drive. But with this 250 horsepower Golf, it's kind of debatable whether the four-wheel drive actually makes even sense. Luckily, I'm driving on this closed course right now. And for some reason, a front-wheel drive car that is similar to mine has appeared in my rearview mirror. So I think we should see if he can keep up. As you can see, it started raining and now look! Well, 
this is a bit awkward because the numbers told us it would actually be pretty close. I, I mean, this both will do north to 100 in little over six seconds, and both will go around the Nurburgring in around eight and a half minutes. So looking at the stats from a piece of paper might suggest that an all-wheel drive system in a hot hatchback simply adds unwanted weight and complexity. But there's one very good reason why you would choose an all-wheel drive car instead of a front-wheel drive car. And that's because winter is coming. And pretty soon the white stuff will start falling from the skies again. And with proper studded winter tires, the Golf will still do a north to a hundred in around six to seven seconds, while the front wheel drive Megane will flash its traction control light and struggle to do ten. And as we saw, it's a similar story in the wet. Sure, a set of new tires would have evened out the score, but this is reality. Both of these cars were running on poor old pieces of rubber, as most of the cars in Finland are. And poor knackered rubber clearly favors the all-wheel drive golf. But George here has a question. Go ahead, George. So it needs to be all-wheel drive, yes? Well, George, in a word, no. Or at least not necessarily. As much as we'd like to think that the engineers in Wolfsburg, Wolfsburg. were fulfilling all of our dreams with planting four instead of two drive shafts in this car, the practice isn't quite the same thing as theory. It's a tough job justifying the drive type solution in a more or less underpowered hot hatch. Especially the weaker examples that got the first few generations of Haldex instead of the Jeul Torsen. And of course you can market these cars with an all-wheel drive badge. But from a driver's point of view, in a performance-biased Golf R32, well, we are not even close to a Lancer Evo in terms of all-wheel drive simplicity and fun. To explain it in simple terms, Executing a sharp all-wheel drive drift leads to front swinging out due to its uneven power distribution. And with the heavy VR6 engine above, or actually almost in front of the first axle, it makes it feel like you're throwing a hammer in the air. The part that you're supposed to hit the nails with is going to finish first. And in addition to this, the Haldex system mostly feels like it doesn't know its place in the universe. Not unless you are fully committed to slamming the gas pedal. Eventually it leads to awkward drifting attempts with your buddies laughing in the background and your girlfriend leaving you for that idiot. And if that didn't make you cry already, you will hit the front wheel on the curbstone and destroy your poor little control arm anyway. You've told Pekka time and time again that an Haldex mod is available from Germany. But you haven't got it yet. And meanwhile Pekka has an Evo and your girlfriend is in the passenger seat. So yes, the all-wheel drive might save your beautiful little butt when you're trying to impress your unamused girlfriend in a snowy supermarket parking lot, but I am 100% sure that shaving 100 kilograms of the weight and ditching the all-wheel drive system would result in far improved lap times and more fun. And fun is something that Pekka wouldn't even understand. Only thing Pekka knows is the goddamn snowy parking lot. What is it now, George? So the R32 is no good then? Again, George, no. The R32 is actually plenty good. But the reasons for it lay elsewhere, and they're unbelievably puzzling. Now, the R32 is not a true driver's car due to its odd weight distribution and drivetrain setup, and it's not a straight-line speed machine either, mostly due to its enormous bulk. But even though it has its sensible VW pants on when it comes to interior space layout and usability, it still has something most VWs are lacking. An engine with the soul. The 3.2 VR6 is a great thumping heart of pure gold. It revs happily and freely. The throttle response is absolutely spot on. And then there's the sound. It's absolutely fantastic. It sounds like a dying dinosaur and the last of the breed as well. And this T-Rex sounds unbelievably sad about going extinct. And ironically that's essentially what it was. The last of the breed. The new Golf R has almost all of the driving dynamic problems sorted out, but it's achieved it by going back to the trusty old VW Palais of grey paints. The R32 was different because it had that one smudge of pink and purple mixed in the Palais as well. 